Hello, Tonsay, and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to APTN In Focus. I am Daryl Stranger. With Christmas right around the corner, we're going to be taking a look at all the wonderful Indigenous arts and crafts that make popular gifts. We are putting Indigenous arts and crafts in focus. We'll speak with Indigenous carvers, crafters, and beaters. And as always, we would love for you to join in on our conversation. You can tweet us at APTN in focus, or you can email in focus at aptn.ca. All right, well, there's no sense in waiting any longer. Let's just jump right into it. Here are some sights and sounds from the annual Indigenous Christmas craft sale in Winnipeg. I taught everyone, yeah, even my, my son, I only got one son, and all my girls are doing it, and now my granddaughters are doing it. It's a dying thing, it's a dying culture for people like me. You know, as, as you walk around here, you won't be able to see what, you know, we're quite different. started off as just like a hobby that I really wanted to learn and start connecting kind of to my culture, to my roots, figuring out who I was as an Indigenous person. I think that it's important for us to create spaces that's specifically for Indigenous people. A lot of these folks that are coming in are Indigenous and they know a lot of our teachings, they know a lot of the things that we bring when we do our beading or when we do our artwork. What I do is uh, what we call traditional harvesting. Our stuff is really handmade, it's really personal. We put a lot of effort into it. For me, everything I make has a spirit, has an energy. Well, it highlights the quality, the craftsmanship, the authenticity of the indigenous artwork that's being created in Manitoba. I think it, it's important that they know where I come from and, uh, and to be able to teach them and they enjoy it is very satisfying. Keep buying. Keep buying. <laughs> <laughs> come and buy some stuff. <laughs> Our first guest on the show today is Machif artist Jacqueline Freeman. She is a painter and a beater and works with many different forms of art material. I spoke with her earlier. Jacqueline, thank you so much for being here on APTN In Focus. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the work that you do? Thanks very much for having me. Um, yeah, I would say that I do beaded jewelry, but not just beaded jewelry in a more uh, contemporary sense. So I work with a variety of materials like leather, quills, beads, um, you know, pieces, uh, materials from the land. So it's really great to work with a variety of different kind of uh, products that are from proudly representing um, Indigenous peoples. Well, the work you do is so wonderful and so beautiful. Um, is, is it something you've always done and, or, or maybe how did you get into it? I would say I haven't always done it. I probably started with the jewelry around 2016. So I was kind of always around uh, Indigenous and specifically Métis Nation art, but I really started doing jewelry probably around 2016. Um, and I, I love jewelry, so I just started making pieces for myself, and then I started making pieces for friends, and then it kind of uh, went from there. Well, and can you explain the journey of, of where, it, where it started and sort of where it is now, and um, you know what, what the journey's been like and sort of where you're at now and in terms of um, your work? Yeah, I, I would say I really kind of started with doing beaded fringe earrings, um, I, I really wanted some pieces for myself and I wasn't really aware of anyone around me that was at the time that, that was making it. I was more familiar with bead embroidery, so traditional Métis beadwork, but I wanted to have pieces that I 
could wear that people could see and it's really nice in in a virtual setting that now you only see people from the head up and it's a nice way to kind of uh, indigenize those calls that you have so yeah I, I think it's just a matter of I had friends that kind of wanted pieces it was an easy way uh, for me to kind of play with all the beads that I already had you know for making vamps and everything else I, I had some beads and just kind of started uh, doing it that way well and you touched on um, making it so that the Indigenous culture shines through. How important is it that uh, we keep these traditions and, and cultures alive uh, through art and through some of this jewelry and, and sort of uh, that way? And how, this is a two-parter, how do you do it through your work as well? Uh, I, I would say that it's really great when you can see other people wearing beaded earrings. You kind of, you get to know who made the piece, you can kind of tell uh, what nation those people maybe came from. And it's always nice, you know, you can see someone from across the room with a really great bougie pair of earrings. And um, it's a way to connect with someone else, maybe from another nation, but maybe your own nation and have that conversation piece. And I think it's also a way to connect to community because you can share your knowledge or your piece, um, your skills and your trades within your own community, but also with other nations. So I, I really enjoyed that part of it. And Jacqueline, how does it feel to, to see your work on the national stage? Um, your earrings were, were on the national debate with uh, our, our former co-worker, Melissa Ridgen. So what was that like for you to, to see that and to see um, all the positive words come from that as well? Uh, I, to me, it's really exciting that someone would reach out specifically to me to have a piece made for them on whatever platform it's on. But I think having pieces on a national stage is, I feel supported, I think, within the community. So that's one really great way, you know, that community acceptance. But I just think it's really cool uh, to have pieces, you know, kind of on TV as, as someone who is maybe a smaller maker, um, maybe new, maybe not, you know, as maybe an artist you want to you want to be able to do more. So it's, it's, kind, it's a good motivation, I think, to keep going and to keep sharing and to keep connecting. Well, and speaking of keeping going, are you able to, like, what are some of your future plans with, with your, your artwork and with your jewelry? And are you able to share with us maybe, um, maybe what some of your future goals are when it comes to the work that you create? Um, future goals. I think that I would really like to connect more to Métis style uh, beadwork. I would like to have a little bit of time to practice bead embroidery and to also study some of the old uh, beadwork patterns. But I'm also really excited that I get to work with different materials all the time and I get to learn how to make uh, fish skin leather um, and to make new pieces with new materials kind of from the land. So I think things are always changing. My, my love obviously is earrings and fringe earrings specifically, but sky's the limit, I think. And I, I really enjoy networking with other artists as well and kind of learning from them different ways to work with different materials. So I think it's just kind of um, sky's the limit, I think, as to as to what comes next. Well, so in, in all the time that you've been you've been doing this and you've been you know creating these pieces, from the start to where it is now, has it sort of exceeded your expectations, or did you have expectations at all for for where this might go? I don't know that I necessarily had expectations when I started. Again, I kind of started to create for myself and then friends and family, and then it it kind of grew from there, and I'm extremely grateful and and humbled by that and i really enjoy creating 
I don't know that I have big expectations uh, for the future. I just want to be able to in, to continue to enjoy creating pieces and, and to grow as an artist, which is still very strange to think, to think when I first started, I never thought I would be an artist. So I, I think that I'm, I'm already comfortable and I already feel connected and, and anything that comes from it will be greatly accepted. Um, yeah, I'm just, I, I want to continue to enjoy it, I think mm -hmm. is the big thing and to continue learning. Well, and we're right in the thick of the holiday season and people are out looking for different gifts and, and what to get their loved ones. And everybody wants to buy local and shop local. And how important is it that we do shop local and, and especially for some indigenous things and then like yourself, how important is that to, for people to shop local and, and for indigenous made items as well? Well, for me as, as a maker and as an artist, obviously that's, that's really important to support indigenous artists because it gives them the opportunity to continue to grow and to feel encouraged and to stay connected to community. I think that buying local is always important, whether that's food, art, uh, clothing, anything, um, to try to support our communities and, and our people in the work that they do. And I think specifically for Indigenous peoples, I think it's a way of, even for myself, that encouragement to keep going, to keep learning and to keep creating and to stay connected. Jacqueline, that's a, that's a great answer, and we certainly wish you the best of luck going forward with all your work. I want to say a big thank you, Miigwech, for coming on and sharing a bit of, of what you do and, and some of the items that you work on. So again, thank you, Miigwech, for taking some time for us here on APTN in Focus. Merci. Thank you. All right, let's go to social media now with our social media editor, Jesse Andrushko, to hear what some of you are saying about today's topic. Now, Jesse, I understand you have some great work to show off by some of our viewers. Yes, I do. Online, we asked our viewers to send us a picture of their latest arts and craft project. We received a lot of awesome submissions, and you can really see the amount of work and time that went into these creations. I've picked out five of my favorites, so let's take a look. First, from Kylie McCallum. She shared these warm brown and white fur mitts with beautiful beadwork made by herself and her mother, Eva. Stunning work. Here's a submission from Enna Lafferty, who lives in Hay River, Northwest Territories. Her favorite pastime is sewing, and she wanted to share some stylish earrings that she made. Lovely stuff. I really like the color palette. Thank you for sharing, Enna. It's freezing here in Winnipeg today, so I wouldn't mind a pair of these. Tamara Sylvester shared some mitts that her and her mother, Barbara, made for the family. They look super warm, and honestly, I really just want to feel them. Here's a cute one from Lena White. She created these little newborn baby wraparound moccasins lined with polar fleece to keep your baby feet nice and snug. I wish my feet were baby feet because I wouldn't mind a pair of these. Lastly, from, from James Fox, he shared a few shots of some stunning beading that he made. Here's a cool one, a turtle shell rattle with beaded handle. Really awesome stuff, I would love to hear it shake. Thank you to everyone that took the time to submit their awesome creations. We have some really talented viewers. You can send your picture of your arts and crafts, email them to infocus at aptn.ca. If you want to share your thoughts on today's topic, here's how. Send an email to infocus at aptn.ca. Like us on Facebook on our APTN news page, or follow and tweet us at APTN in Focus. That's certainly great work by everyone there. All right, we have to step aside for a short break, but still to come, we'll speak with more Indigenous crafters. Stay with us. Welcome back to APTN In Focus. There are so many great Indigenous artists and crafters and beaters across Turtle Island. One of them is Laura Asham, the owner of Asham Creations. She sells amazing puppets of all kinds. And here's a quick look at some of what she does. Christmas is just around the corner. And for Laura Asham, that means spending hours in her sewing room on Sixtica Nation. 
making the dresses and ribbon shirts. Granny dress. Only these little guys will fit. So these puppets have been a hit in done. southern Alberta. Ashram gets so many orders, it's, it's become a job for the whole family. When we get an order, like, my whole house is busy. Um, I'm working in here, and then my son's in the next room. He's doing all the foam. My husband's upstairs. He's trying to finish, um, like, he stuffs the hands and the arms. And then he does the legs for me. And then my um, older daughter and my younger daughter does the moccasins. Asham Creations is an award-winning business from buckskin wedding cakes to beaded horse regalia. She learned the art from her mother and sister and has been designing beadwork since she was seven years old. But there is something about these puppets that make them a community favorite. Each comes as a set dressed in traditional clothing and moccasins with attention to detail. This is my first grandma. When I was creating her, I needed to really feature the, the face. So I um, made wrinkles on the side of her face and then I put gray hair on her. I had a lot of material left over to see if I can do a set. And I wanted to do a boy and a girl just to see how it would look. So I made my first set of puppets and um, I went around to the, to the community and they were saying that it looks really professionally done. She's had orders from schools and daycares, even from Same health services on Siksika. Now her puppets have become a learning tool, a fun way for children to have conversations in Indigenous languages. The kids really relate to those puppets. When I had them um, at our powwow or any place, the kids will say, hey, they go to my school. It, it brings a lot of joy. These are my babies and they're going across Canada and they're going to be leaving me and going into good homes. So. <laughs> Yeah. Laura, thanks so much for taking some time and joining us here on APTN In Focus. We've spoken to you previously uh, for another story, and you were creating puppets then. What is Asham Creations uh, working on now? Are you still creating these puppets? Yes. Um, in 2018, I was only doing the First Nation puppets, and um, we, we just started kind of like branching out only in southern Alberta. So... Um, after the interview uh, in 2018, um, we were getting a lot of orders and stuff. And then I created the um, the Métis puppets. So the this is the Métis puppets. I have the boy and girl with me. Um, they have a sash and the, like both puppets have a sash. And then I have the, the granny and grandpa Métis puppets and the boy and girl puppets. So now I do sell the First Nations Granny and Grandpa and the First Nations Boy and Girl, as well as the Métis Granny and Grandpa and the Métis Boy and Girl. I also do a lot of other stuff too, not just puppets. So yeah. What is some of that other stuff, Laura? Um, I've made, um, I make, I make uh, earmuffs. These are beaded earmuffs. I don't know. I try and make stuff that people never see out there. So I, this is my earmuffs that I make, and people always like them. And I, uh, I made some for my daughter-in-law and my other um, kids' earmuffs. So there's all kinds of stuff that I make. I make babies in moss bags here, and I have. I was doing these babies. So these were a really good seller too. And um, a while back, when I started making these babies. My late sister had a little um, Bob Marley doll, and she was asking me if I can make her, uh, if I can make Bob Marley in a moss bag. So this is my little Bob Marley. So yeah. <laughs> that is amazing. That's amazing. And so we're talking about the the babies in the moss bag. I have right here actually um, a little baby Grinch in the moss bag. Um, yeah. I mean, th this is just the cutest little thing, and, and uh, I mean, the work you do is simply just incredible. Um, so I guess, what sort of gave you the idea to, to do this in the first place and, and to start these puppets and, and what you do? From the puppets, it all comes back to my kids. Like, everything that I do, it always comes back to my kids. How I started the, the, the puppets was from my daughter, my youngest daughter. She was doing a, um, a talent for a princess pageant, and I asked her to do a puppet show. And, of course, I just didn't do, like, the regular puppet. I wanted to do something different. So that, that's how we created the puppets. That's how the puppets came to be, was from her. 
again, um, my youngest daughter, when she was really tiny and little, we bought her a little doll. And um, so I made that doll, I, I made a moss bag for that doll. So a lot of people liked it. So then I started, that's how I started the babies in the moss bag. So those were going out really, really fast. And I couldn't cup, keep up with the demand on some of these stuff. So, and then um, I usually just try to change into something different, you know. Um, I, and then I started making the teddy bears. So I, I figured, well, I'll try something different that, that people don't see out there. So I, I, I make, um, I make the flames teddy bears. I even make the um, jets teddy bears. They're like, you know, they're really cute teddy bears. Mm -hmm. And I also make um, the Pendleton, kind of like Pendleton teddy bears. Right, so yeah, beautiful. these are the stuff that I make. And like, once I make stuff like this, they, they go really, really fast, you know, and um, I put them on my Facebook page or I, sell them uh, like out of word of mouth you know so i do a lot like i do a lot of sewing like this mm -hmm. but um i also do beadwork well so just so, on that note you said uh, everything just goes so fast why why do you think your work and, and these puppets and everything you do is is in such high demand um i think it's because people don't see them out there you know you don't see first nation puppets out there and um i'm so happy to say that my uh, my dream was to try and get my First Nations out there, like across Canada. So since 2018, my puppets have, we reached um, BC, Alberta, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, um, Ottawa, and is it Quebec? So we reached those nations, or like those provinces, as well as the Blackfeet Nation down in the US. So they're, they're really going out in all like, and I'm, I'm really happy for that. And I'm, I'm really kind of hoping we would get more out there. So, mm -hmm. um, like I said, people don't see stuff that I make. Like, you know, you don't see um, beaded earmuffs out there. I try to make some stuff that people don't ever see out there. So it's something different. Um, just like I went to a, a um, education conference and uh, you know how teachers they they use pointer sticks, you know, to show kids. So I beaded a pointer stick. Oh, so that's I saw, that's gorgeous too. That's something different, you know, like a beaded pointer stick. Mm. So it's something different that you know to try and gauge kids in. You know, my thought is about kids. You know, it's just like with the puppets. Um, you, well, I just, just like. To Mm -hmm. So ahead. I don't mean to cut you off, Laura, but just on, on the topic of, of the children, I mean, why is it so important for these children to have access to some of these toys that they can relate to and, and that is part of their culture? And I understand um, you also do some work with some schools too, right? Like you just said, the pointer sticks. Um, and, and do you do some stuff with schools as well in terms of uh, puppets or whatever it may be? Um, well, like sometimes I would um, do crafts with kids. Okay. Um, I was doing that before COVID. Hey, my cousin would give me a call and we would do this, this big craft thing like at Christmas time. So I would have a station that we would do crafts with these kids and each grade would come in and we would do a craft thing. So whoever would call me like um, mostly on my reserve to come and do a craft with them, I would do I would do something like that. It's not only kids, it's also adults too. So some departments would call me and say, do you know, how, can you come in and teach Moggasins, you know? And so I, I would come in, you know, and teach Moggasins. So it's not just like kids, it's, it's adults too. So, which I, I'm, I'm really grateful for because I get to show my gift to other people. And we're approaching or we're in holiday season now. Um, so what's it like at your house during, during this time? Uh, how busy are you and are you and, and your family? It's really busy. Like it, it's kind of crazy right now. I'm, I'm doing um, centerpieces and um, I, I make little teepees out of clay. And my daughter, my youngest daughter showed me how to do that. So I, I do the clay and then I make little teepees and it's like, you know, like the Christmas balls. So I have it in, in like in, it's like a wreath kind of a thing. Okay, so I'm doing yeah. those right now. So those ones, um, like I would make some, and then I would just show the picture on Facebook or whatever, 
and then people would call me if if they wanted some and then, um so, so like i said sometimes what, what i make it just goes really fast and then sometimes i would get orders but i can't do the order because it's it's so large i just recently got an order asking me if i can do 20 centerpieces Oh, by wow. the 20th and i'm going oh geez no i don't think so <laughs> it's too crazy <laughs> but yeah christmas time is my busiest time of year well so yeah. and just on that what's it like working with your family as well and, and having that connection of of making everything together um making stuff with my my kids and my um it's it's going like togetherness and it's also teaching them some of the stuff that I do. And I always tell them, you, if you're gonna be baking stuff, you have to think uh, that you, you're the client. So if you're going to make stuff, make it well, make it good. Mm -hmm. Because if you're gonna sell this item, this person's not gonna like, like it. But if you do well, do your work and um, people like the good quality of, of the work. So well, it really is good, uh, good quality. I mean, just with, with this guy right here, I mean, it's a, next to next to none here with the quality. Um, but if yeah. somebody wants to order from you, where can they do that? And can you give us maybe a price point of some of the stuff that you sell? Um, so for an example, um, I'll give you an example. So I make these little tiny moccasins like this. So I just made these like really quick for for an item like this, I would probably sell them maybe about $60 because of the hide and the beads. Right. The beads are like, they went up in price, same with hide. And then plus your, your time making them. Mm -hmm. So something like that. And then I also make these little tiny beaded uh, moccasins or little keychains. I sell these for $50, you know, so they they do go up you know in the time to to do something like this and again people don't ever see little tiny beaded moccasins out there right yeah so i will try to do something that um are are different that people don't see um and another thing too i made a a rose it's out of um, native um native ribbon native oh that's printing. beautiful so like i said people don't see stuff like this i was trying to um, think out of the box of what people would like to see, you know, like, like, like to, um, you know, like it, it's just, and then when they see them, they, they, they can't believe that I make these stuff. I was even asked a question, how do you make these stuff? Where did you get this idea? And to tell you, <laughs> to tell you the truth is, um, I just think of it, like it, it just comes to me, like, you know, mm -hmm. so. <laughs> well, and just quickly before we let you go, as uh, people can reach out through email or, or on your Facebook, is that uh, how they get in touch yeah, with you? They could, they, could e they could either email me or Facebook, either one. I always check my my messages and stuff. And um, like I said, my puppets, we do orders for puppets and some schools order like a large quantity of puppets. and. Um, we always, I always ask them, are you looking for First Nations or are you looking for Métis? So those, my puppets are my big, biggest sellers right now. And just before we end our little conversation, how much is, is a puppet or something like this? For um, a baby in a moss bag, for a little tiny one like this, it, it's $60. But if you're going to want something that's going to be um, more of a personal note, then the price goes up. Right. It's because it's um, a unique item and one of a kind kind of a thing. Same with the the puppets. The this is my line. This is how the puppets I would sell. Mm -hmm. But if a person would want a, a different style or something added, then that price goes up. And I do sell my puppets. I sell them in sets. So the boy and girl is a set. I sell them for five hundred a set. Gotcha. Same with, yeah. So each puppet, like the granny and grandpa set is 500 a set. But if they want something that's um, to like, say if like, if they want to put their logo on there, their school logo, then that's, that's for them. So then the price would go up. So I try to accommodate the people that what they're asking for. So that's, that's how I, I really try to talk on how, what, what they would want. So, like, say if you wanted um, 
a puppet mm -hmm. that's um, for you and then your your um, like say for the aptn you know they wanted a puppet specifically so then we would do the i would do ask you for the aptn logo or anything that you want on there so then like i said i would tell you this is how much it is but then the price would go up then we would do negotiations from there and what does it mean to you, Laura, to, to see everybody interested in your work and, and wanting to buy everything that you do? What's that mean to you? That means a lot to me because it gives me pride because I, I was taught from my late mom and I was also taught from my sisters. Um, so bringing that gift and showing everybody this is what I do and then having them smile and um, especially with the puppets, you when you see the puppets, like people, their their inner child comes out, and even even elders, you know, you, like I'm looking at them smiling because they they're playing with them. So that gives me really a lot of pride and joy just to have my work out there. And then I'm really hoping that we would really branch more so out in Canada and the U.S. So I'm trying to get all my my Indians out there. So that's my <laughs> that's my nation <laughs> well it's certainly great work Laura and everything that you do is, is such uh, high quality as well uh, I think that's a great way to leave our conversation but I want to say a big thank you Miigwech to you for joining us and uh, best of luck with, with everything and I'm sure uh, people will be reaching out uh, for your work and your puppets yeah and I'd like to say thank you for to my nation there are really big um, supporters for, for me and I'd like to thank my family and then thank you guys for, for helping me um, show my stuff, show my work out there. So I'm really grateful. Thank you. <laughs> for many Inuit living in Yellowknife, visiting family back home isn't always in the cards, especially around the holiday season. That's why one local organization has been bringing Christmas cheer to them. Our reporter Charlotte Moore Jacobs has this story. In Kulgarok, Merry Christmas. Talogarok, Merry Christmas. Cambridge Bay, Kovalokdok. It was a week before Christmas when all through Yellowknife, Inuit Tugutagatakik hold a gathering that's larger than life. The babies are nestled snug in the Amounties, while folks feast on potluck goods and Christmas candies. I would like to say a Merry Christmas to my two boys in Joe Haven. I'm here in Yellowknife to wait for my granddaughter to be born. And to my other half in Goose Lake, Merry Christmas for me and Precious. The games are aplenty and people bustle about after two long years when a pandemic put the event on timeout. It's going really good. It's so fun. It's nice to be all together again um, after the pandemic. Charlie and his daughter, Jamie Kudlak, spend months organizing, towering work, but the smiles make it so energizing. You know, they don't get to see it very much because of the location they're in and how hard it is to get out back to their home. And the, the reward is just seeing people having a good time, enjoying themselves, and it's like they're feeling like they're at home for one night. Since 2018, the nonprofit's been growing with dreams of expanding and projects ongoing. The food security and getting um, getting country food from the northern communities, from the hunters up there, to um, provide us with some um, country food and we uh, divvy it up and distribute it to the, um, the local population here. While the high cost of airfare makes it hard to go home, it's a nice alternative so there's no reason to roam. All our friends that we haven't seen for years, we've been here 20 years and it's been a long time, but we think about people back from back home all the time, so they're in my heart. Well, wishes are given as the night comes to close with gratitude in their hearts for this Yellowknife Inuit family they've chose. All right, we have to take one final break here. Don't go any, anywhere. We'll have more Indigenous Arts and Crafts talk coming up. Join our conversation now. Like us on Facebook on our APTN News page. Follow or tweet us at APTN In Focus. 
and send your thoughts to infocus at aptn.ca. Welcome back to APTN In Focus. Uh, joining us now on the show is John Sabarin. John is a Dene artist from the Northwest Territories who primarily is a carver, but he's been known to paint in the past as well. He joins us now. John, thanks so much for taking some time today here at uh, APTN In Focus. First off, can you just tell us a little bit about uh, what, what you do and, and maybe how you got started? Oh, um, I carve stone for a living, um, pretty much six days a week. Um, it's a relationship between animals and human beings and transformations and um, grew up in Fort Simpson, North of Sertors, and now I uh, live in Yellowknife. So I've just been carving pretty much six days a week. So what got you started in carving, John? Um, I started painting in, in college and uh, and when I was living in the north, I had a lot of friends who carved stone. So there's always carvings around me. So eventually I tried it and um, I, got, I got hooked. I got addicted to carving stone. What was it about the, the carving stone that, that got you so hooked on it? Uh, well, visually I can see, like when you look at a block and people are frustrated like because it's the block. And visually I can see both sides and the bottom and I can see um, 360 degrees around around the block, so it it was easier for me to to focus on um, what was coming out of the block. Now you had mentioned uh, j just a bit earlier the a lot of what you do is focused on the relationship between humans and nature. Why is that such a big focus for you in in the work that you do? Um, well, I think I I, I grew up um, with um, a lot of trappers, hunters, and trappers when I was little. And there's not much hunters and trappers today. So a lot of the stories and legends that I heard growing up, just not full on stories, but just bits and pieces of it. So trying to gather what I remember and what I heard and try to just fix those into today's stories. And how big of a role does your Dene heritage factor into, into the work, um, your work? Um, pretty much. 90% of the, the work I'm doing is pretty much the stories that are heard and, um, and it's pretty what I'm trying to focus on is trying to focus on my own identity, trying to find um, where I fit in today, today, today's world with other artists doing their own work and I'm trying to um, blend my, my own heritage with today's, today's work. And given the, we're talking a bit about the relationship between humans and nature, what is the relationship between humans and nature in, in, in your culture? Um, they're, they're, they're balancing. There's always kind of a balance where humans go in and, and, and animals learn to um, adapt to what was happening in the area. Like if, like if we're going out on the land and we're building a cabin or even like overnighting, animals know we're there. And, and just being able to, even we, we har um, harvest animals in the fall and, and in the winter. So they, they know we're there and they hear us and, and the, you see wolves running, bears. So like, I'm so familiar with seeing northern animals. So it's just a common theme for me is just to carve, oh, I see a black bear, I'm gonna carve a black bear. And I see the raven up here is pretty common. So that and I do a lot of ravens too. So just and, things that I see every day. And when it comes to, to carving, John, uh, you do stone carvings. Why, why was it stone specifically that, that you chose to, to work with? Um, I found it easier and when you carve stone, you find that everything else is blocked out. So you only, it's only me and the stone. It's a challenge to bring the stone out. And and with painting, you have that sort of um, thing, but it's flat. And and I found it easier just to turn the block around and, and, and work on the other side. And uh, for me, I can see it better and I find it easier to to carve now, John, I understand that when you're done with a piece, you feel the, the piece no longer belongs to you, right? Um, mm -hmm. I, I was reading yeah. that uh, what other people see in, in the carving and how they connect with it, uh, that's their yeah. story to tell. I, I just think that's super interesting. Uh, have you always felt that way about your work? Yeah, um, I've always felt that it wasn't really mine. It was always for somebody else. Um, there are some pieces I kept for uh, maybe a couple of years, kept at home, 
and um, and then finally I thought, okay, well it's time to for it to leave my house. So and then sure enough, it's it's somebody likes it and they they want it in their own house. So why is that though? I'm just curious. Like, well, I know some artists maybe like it's even though they might sell it or something, they still have that personal connection. Why for you mm -hmm. is, is that different? Um, I guess it's it's like a parent. I guess you, you you grow to love it, and and then eventually it has to find its own. You have it leaves the house, and you let somebody else love it and and, and care for it, and that's why I, that's why I see it. And do you have a favorite process, John? And 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 in, in the overall process of, of making these these carvings, do you have a favorite process or stage of working when it comes to, to completing a work of art? Yeah, it's uh, it's angle grinding work when you first get started. So you, and and you, you use a saw as well too to, to remove a lot of the negative space on there to get close as possible you can to do the hand work, which is all by Fordham and and, and power tools. So it's all power tools. So pretty much getting cutting out the block and, and making some sort of image out of it. Now, when it comes to, sorry, I just want to back up a bit here. And, and how did you get started in, in art in the first place? You'd mentioned you went to school to, to for painting to start with, but what led you to yeah. that decision in the first place? Um, well, I did a, a printmaking workshop way back in uh, 1990. I forgot what, what year it was. And I saw all these um, artists up in Cape Dorset. So I was walking around and watching all of these carvers produce a, um, a seal, produce a polar bear, produce um, some other images. And I, I thought, wow, that's that's really cool. I'll be out there shivering and freezing because it'd be cold out. And I was watching these famous guys, I mean, older guys, and, and now they're not around anymore. But just to, like, I was sitting there going, wow, this is what I want to do. And looking back on, on all of your work and, and all the years that you've done doing, doing carvings and just being in the art scene, what sort of advice would you have for you know, a young Indigenous person that's maybe looking to get into the art scene or maybe they're like, oh, maybe I want to try it, I'm not sure. What, what sort of advice would you have? Uh, my good advice is just to research a lot of other artists see what's going on out there as well as uh, do a lot of drawing. I did a lot of drawing since I was seven anything like pencil and paper, Xerox paper, whatever paper I can find or pencils or pen, just to do little ideas and stuff. So so I found it easier um, so I can draw. I draw all over my, my stone, my block to figure out where things are gonna be and how things are gonna be balanced on, on, on the rock. So I think it's just a lot of research and, and just practice, just, just do it day in, day out. And are you able to share maybe uh, what, what you have coming up personally? Do you have any, any shows or are you going to be in a gallery or any, anything coming up for yourself, John? Um, right now, I'm just um, trying to get a lot of commission work done. So I still have several more to do and, and uh, um, trying to sell my collection too. From um, I have which posted on my website too. So I'm trying, trying to work on some new ideas too. And if somebody wanted to, uh, to reach out to you to, to have some work done, how can they do that, do that John? They can go to my website, johnsavin.com, or john at johnsavin.com to contact me. And it's great um, getting emails and getting contacts from other people. And have you been contacted by uh, somebody that maybe you, you thought you might not have, have seen at all? I mean, what, when your work was in Australia, was that sort of a, a shock to you, uh, maybe, at, at, for somebody that you, might, you, you thought might not have uh, reached out to you? Um, well, the, yeah, the person came to my shop and... Uh, they, they, they came in and they saw everything, and uh, they were go, they were going back home, and they wanted a piece of my art with them. So I said, okay, well, I can do this for you, and, and I did a quick drawing, and they said they wanted these images in there. So the wife wanted the tree, the daughter wanted the loon, and the guy wanted the raven. So I incorporated all of those designs, and and they loved it. So quick drawing, quick design. And how many? pieces of, of art you work on at a time is it just one at a time uh or, or do you sort of start at you know a couple just one just one at a time but sometimes when other people call and they want something then then i'll quickly doodle on another block and then just leave it sitting so so while i'm finishing or working on one right now it's still in the back of my mind that this other piece is there so and then and then i'll get to the piece 
Well, your brain sounds like it's always working. Like you said, you do it uh, yeah. six days a week or, or so. So, yeah. um, John, I mean, your work, your work is beautiful, John. Uh, well, I think we're going to have to leave the, the discussion there. But I want to say a big thank you, Miigwech, to you for taking some time out of your day to share a bit of what you do and, and the work that you do. Mafichou. Thank you for having me. All right, this next story is one that you just can't help but smile at when you watch it. With the holiday season in full swing, craft sales are key in helping to support Indigenous artists. Here's one sale that helps support indig Indigenous women behind bars. It's an art sale organized by women to help women. Everything sold here is beaded by an Indigenous woman who is either incarcerated or recently released. There was something that I enjoyed doing and I was really good at, so I took, it made my time go by um, better, I guess, easier and faster. For Jennifer Clark, beating helped pass the time while in the Women's Correctional Center in Headingley, Manitoba. It connects you to your roots. It really helps you find yourself and who you are being Indigenous. I've learned a ton from these ladies. I've gained friends lifelong friends. Sandra Burling co-founded the Women Helping Women Beadwork Group online, where people from all over the world can buy. It started when Burling received a gift in the mail from jailed artist Trilai Anderson. Their kids were dating. And she was just incarcerated at the time and sending me gifts and her beadwork was really incredible. And I talked to her and asked her through her son if she wanted to sell her beadwork and she thought that would be a really great idea. So she shared this, um, I guess, platform with the other ladies who were in Headingley in the Women's Correctional Centre. From there, the group grew. Burling is now helping dozens sell their work well behind bars. It just evolved and now getting to know these women and their circumstances and, you know, the fact that they are coming out of jail without anything and you know not having housing not having support not having medication um, it, it to me is just really a desperate situation 100 percent of the sales go directly back to the artist so the money from the sale of the, the the beadwork is really helpful for them in the sense that they can um, a lot of people send money to their family it helps buy canteen items, which all the beadwork, all the beads and the ne uh, needles and the thread, it's all canteen items. And so they continue to replenish what they've sold. So the money is extremely helpful for them, as well as saving for when they get out. Clark says it brings opportunity for a better life after incarceration. Um, like I feel like I finally found something that I want to do with myself, like with my life, you know. And I think beating is that because I, enjoy, I actually enjoy doing it. And I did a lot of it while I was in there. I would beat all day every day and, well, not all day every day, but most of the time. And yeah, I'm, I'm really good at it. I enjoy it, so found something that I like to do. Now, if you would like, you can buy the beadwork online. You can search women helping women underscore beadwork and send a direct message to the page. All right, that's uh, all we have for you on this lighthearted in focus. Today's episode will be available as a podcast. You can listen and subscribe on aptnnews.ca slash podcasts or find us on your favorite player. And if you missed any of our past episodes and you want to catch up, you can find them and more on aptnnews.ca slash in focus. We leave you today with some absolutely wonderful Christmas carols sung by Amanda Gendron. I'm Daryl Stranger. Thank you for joining us, Chimmy Witch, and happy holidays to everyone. I heard there was a secret chord that David played and it pleased the Lord But you don't really care for music, do you? Well, it goes like this, the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall the major lift, the baffle king composing, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah,
what you needed proof you saw her bathing on the roof her beauty and the moonlight overthrew you she ties you to her kitchen chair she broke your throne she cut your hair and from your lips she drew 